All right. This is the philosophical angle, defining concepts in current media. I am your host, Chris Angle, and I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Nature of Aesthetics. These books are available free for viewing online at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me is my panelist, Rick Samuelson. Rick graduated from Yale, has an MBA from Wharton, an MA from Tufts, and is retired from the investment banking business. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of the concepts and topics in current media and offer an explication of its essence. This week, we're going to uh, tackle the problem of the non-existent recovery. Economists have been baffled by how slow the recovery is, and especially the political establishment. They're beside themselves that there has been no recovery. Actually, lately, the GDP is actually going downward. So let's examine this problem and see if we can come up with, a, with uh, why that is. Why is there no recovery from the 2008 crash? You'll remember that in September, uh, a crash began. And in October, it got very much underway. The stock market uh, lost a tremendous amount of its value in just a few short weeks. And the economy itself crashed and went into a negative uh, GDP and then started to later recover. recover. Uh, probably the recovery began in fe uh, March or April of 2009 and gradually has um, uh, ascended. But lately, there are now worries of a double dip recession and, and, uh, and the really the stopping of the progress, economic progress that we, were, that we were having. And why is that? So we've made up a, a few diagrams here. So let's, um, let's go to the board and uh, talk about this a little bit. As we said, the problem of, uh, of the non-existent recovery. Why is it not coming back? Why is there a, a, a chance of a double dip recession coming about? Why is GDP not advancing, actually starting to decrease now? over this last year, over this year. Let's start with some very basic principles. When a company manufactures a product, it takes its, its time, its effort, in an atmosphere of risk, and its material, and its knowledge and information to produce a product. It sacrifices its knowledge, it uses its knowledge, it sacrifices its time, its effort, its material to produce a product. And then it takes its product to an exchange of some sort, whether it's the New York Stock Exchange, obviously, that's where stocks trade back and forth, or a store, that's where you can exchange goods for money. So retail stores are often the uh, the, the end uh, area of the products, but there can be interim areas. One manufacturer may sell its products to another manufacturer, which uses those products inside its product. But eventually, it finds up, in all cases, to some exchange where ultimately it benefits consumers. So on the other side of the exchange, we have to the company products entering whatever exchange it is, you've got a consumer sacrifice. So the consumers, they spend their time, they spend their energy, they use their knowledge and information in an atmosphere of risk at their job. So they're sacrificing these things at their job and they uh, and the job at, at, at their company, and the company uses uh, their, their sacrifice to, pr to produce 
something. And from that job, they get a reward, your salary. Or in some cases, if you're an entrepreneur, you start the, your own company and you get the, uh, your own reward. So people get jobs from, from their sacrifice at the company. And what they do with that is, when they have, is that they are now able to take the reward and they use that to fulfill their own demands that they have. And so they take their demand and they go to the exchange, like a Walmart, like a, like a Target, like a Sears, like any of the stores in the mall, and they go with their ability to make a demand on an, in an exchange for products that will make their life better. And that's basically economic activity. So what causes an increase in this demand that allow an increase in economic activity? Well, as the demand information comes back to the exchange, the exchange, the information that there is a great demand or an increasing demand, that exchange, as Milton Friedman pointed out, it doesn't remain there that information goes back to the product, to the company, and, or to the several companies that, that were involved in making a product. And so we go back to the company that makes the product, and inside that risk, inside that information and knowledge, that time and that energy and the material, if you can make these variables more efficient, you make the company produce more with less. The company becomes therefore more profitable and the consumers that work at the company are rewarded with, a, with, more, uh, with more profit from the company and therefore their salaries go up and therefore their demand increases and that information comes back to the company and that's all due to an efficiency in the in the sacrifice that the company makes. But it can also work the other way. If you have an efficiency, you also can have an inefficiency also. So where can the inefficiency and efficiencies come from? We just exa examined that efficiency comes from inside the, 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 uh, the variables of the sacrifice. What would cause an inefficiency here? Let's go to our next chart. Here we've listed the essence of our sacrifice in this column. And so what kind of uh, inefficiencies can come out? Let's say in risk. You've got tax risk, political risk, regulatory risk. Political uh, risk are such as laws being created uh, that might affect company behavior inefficiently. Or maybe, uh, hopefully though, government acts responsibly and produces laws that uh, help society. But I fear that that might not be the case recently. In knowledge, the government sometimes helps with R&D. Of course, you have private R&D. Companies often have, uh, put part of their budget to research and development. Governments also, also uh, uh, invest in research and development also. The, the space program has, has been, is famous for producing a huge amount of, uh, of knowledge and invention that uh, private enterprise has taken and used it uh, to produce products that are uh, uh, that they can bring to uh, the retail market more efficiently. Uh, running shoes are a product of that. We all jog on, uh, on running shoes and that came out of the space program. And there's, hu there's hundreds of products such as like that. So anyway, w here let's go back to risk. One of the things that can produce an inefficiency are the regulatory byproducts of legislation. 
And recently, these come to mind that, have, uh, that I feel have a, an influence on inefficiencies reflecting on company activity and product making activity. Dodd-Frank in the last four years have, has come around. Tremendous influence to the financial markets uh, with greater regulatory uh, oversight, making, uh, making it more difficult for financial companies to operate efficiently. The EPA has been unleashed, as it were. Uh, the Keystone Pipeline, uh, drilling, all of them have been uh, put on the back burner. Uh, the FDA, new drugs that come out, uh, it takes now a billion dollars to get a drug uh, to marketplace. So a lot of good drugs that, uh, if they're not well funded, never make it to the marketplace, even though they might be something that be a, uh, might be a good product. Who knows? We never know because regulations usually prevent the company before it makes the product. So it's very difficult when an inefficient inefficiency hits the company before it makes its product. What what the ultimate result of that is. Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, that's uh, actually created in the, in the Bush years, uh, but nevertheless still retains its uh, uh, influence today. Uh, back when the uh, EPA, or uh, when the, I, uh, the uh, uh, IPO uh, industry was uh, uh, flourishing in, in, uh, in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley came along, uh, a, another law coming out of Congress and its regulations effectively killed that entire uh, uh, industry. It all moved off to London. Then lastly, down here, we also have the Federal Reserve. Everybody must notice, have noticed, notice that gold has really doubled in the last, what, four, five, six years? Maybe in the last four years? The Federal Reserve with its uh, um, sluices of uh, wide open have caused oil and commodities to prices to go up. There's an inefficiency that hits the companies. Also, there's one more efficiency in our chart here down here. What happens to inflation when the Federal Reserve causes inflation? You get material costs, inefficiency, commodities, price increase and inefficiency, and the most pernicious of all, inflation causes is a penalty on savers. It's, a, it's an automatic tax on savers, and that savings go to the spenders. And who's the biggest spender? The U.S. government. So let's, let's make a little chart here. We'll add up on one side the downward inefficiency that might cause a, a downturn in the economy, and we'll add it up with what we've got on the other side. So on the downward pressure we've seen, we've got tax regulations, EPA regulations, FDA regulations, Dodd-Frank regulations, Sarbanes-Oxley regulations. We've got inflation on causing material costs, commodities, savers are being penalized. It's a, it's a, it's a silent tax on savers. On the other side, though, we have research and development uh, going on. Companies are profitable still, so they're able to spend uh, uh, and invest on research and development, which causes new knowledge to come forth. And knowledge is the, really the key ingredient in making companies in, in, uh, uh, efficient to produce a, a, a more, a, a more uh, products that will uh, help your lives and, and uh, better your lives. So corporate profit picture is good, allowing R&D to flourish. And uh, they also, corporations uh, in the sight of all these inefficiency, well, they, they try and make people work a little bit harder. So they increase their effort, and they make them work a little bit longer. So, and for that, they've, they've been able to show a profit 
along with the knowledge. So there you got the two sides. Which side is winning? It appears that maybe the government side is causing more downturn uh, than the private side is causing an upturn. But I'd like to uh, turn to my panelist and uh, ask Rick what his thoughts are about who's winning or what's, who's going to win this, this war of efficiencies. And um, Rick, any thoughts? So you feel there's a, a, a negative influence on government spending, a correlation perhaps, between governments? Well, there was actually, yeah, there was actually an interesting article by uh, uh, Professor Laffer, Dr. Laffer, a few weeks back in the journal, where he compared a, a whole series of countries that had undertaken uh, expansions uh, in government spending following a serious recession, and it found that the correlation is pretty clear. Uh, you know, governments that, you know, pump prime and, and, and grow the government spending most rapidly tend to have the worst performance in the private sector immediately after. So... <laughs> ah, pretty interesting. Uh, yeah, that, that, that was pretty conclusive. So, the, uh, so let's recap that article. So uh, I didn't see it myself. Uh, there's a correlation between the size of government, uh, which is naturally uh, uh, proportional to the amount that a government spends, and the inefficiency or the amount that a country either grows or doesn't grow. Is that, is that correct? Is that, uh, is that the summation of what this article said? Yeah, it's, um, it's imperfect, but there's a clear negative correlation between government spending and the rate at which an economy recovers uh, following uh, a, a serious downturn. Okay, so... Across, uh, I think probably had 25 or 30 countries listed there. 
Okay, and now uh, is it not true though that the uh, that uh, the U.S. government is now it's increasing its proportion of spending per GDP? Is that is that correct? I think I read that somewhere that it's gone up from uh, historically at around 18, 19 percent. Now it's breached 20 percent, heading up toward 25 percent, and expected to grow even more with uh, the Obamacare looming in the near future. Uh, is that uh, is that correct? Yes, and I think Obama said that he was quite comfortable in a situation where the government dominates a quarter of the economy. I think he thinks that's perfectly normal. So uh, you think with the uh, increase in the uh, uh, the government sector spending and uh, that this will not only uh, detract presently but in the future also the the uh, the growth the future growth of the United States economic growth I'm Ab speaking of absolutely okay so what are your predictions what do you look forward uh, to here is Obamacare going to uh, going to have a great influence going forward? Is that going to cause our uh, GDP not to, uh, uh, not to get past, uh, well, it's already, what, has it been uh, down to 1.5 percent? Um, and uh, has been falling uh, recently and being adjusted downward. What do you see going forward, Rick? Well, I find it very interesting that uh, the stock market is actually doing pretty well in the United States. Uh, even though it's pretty clear the earnings cycle has turned. So the only reason for the stock market to be going up is because the, the perception of risk seems to be falling away. Now, why would that be the case? I mean, you've got all these problems in Europe. Uh, Greece is always teetering on the verge of bankruptcy and, and uh, so on and so forth. Why would there be an increase in optimism? I suspect the market's beginning to price in a Romney Ryan victory. Uh, and I suspect on the back of that, uh, Obamacare in its current form it will never actually be implemented. Uh, in other words, it will be either rescinded entirely or large parts of it rescinded in favor of a Ryan-like voucher program or a, a program with elements of that. Wouldn't that require a Senate uh, majority also? Uh, yes, it would. 